Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman, and I am your host. And my guest today is Carol Kivler. She is an author, speaker, and advocate here to talk about recovery from mental illness. Welcome. Thank you. So um, you've had a very personal journey with mental illness, and it's kind of a word we even hate to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, immediately people form opinions and assessments and judgments and relate to you differently. Uh, but I'd like to talk about your journey because I think a, uh, you know, you're now an advocate and you have a message for people, but your story is personal and therefore can provide a connection to anybody going through mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could just start, you know, who were you before the de you had clinical depression? Who were you before clinical depression hit? And then how did that end up in clinical depression? Uh, I was a part-time college professor at Mercer County Community College in the business department. Had three healthy children, a loving husband, a beautiful home, and money in the bank. And depression brought me to my knees. I started with a lot of physical symptoms, went to the GP. He started testing me for some physical um, illnesses. Everything came back negative. Eventually, he said, I believe that you're struggling with clinical depression. Okay, I'm going to stop you here, because that's a huge journey mm -hmm. uh, in, in those sentences. So you, what kind of physical symptoms were you having that then nobody could diagnose? I was having, I had major sleep disruption. I was losing a lot of weight without um, trying. I had joint aches. Uh, I had a, a headache all the time. It felt like I had a helmet on my head press, pressing in. Um, I had um, uh, just a feeling of I couldn't make a decision. Uh, I, I had a lack of concentration. It was hard for me to read and comprehend. So they were testing for things like lupus, multiple sclerosis, and finally the doctor said, I believe it's clinical depression. Now, so when, when you have a lot of symptoms mm -hmm. and you're feeling, you know, you've been operating as a professor and mm -hmm. have a full life, and suddenly there's this kind of these things creeping in, it can start to be undermining and it, you're looking for a diagnosis at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. So now he comes up with clinical depression. Did that like hit you out of left field or? It did because no one in my family ever had depression. And more importantly, I didn't know what I had to be depressed about. There was nothing, no trauma in my life, no loss, no grieving, nothing, nothing to that sort. And so I thought, what do I have to be depressed about? And the doctor explained to me that there's a, a chemical imbalance in your brain. That's what causes depression to begin with. And uh, sent me to a psychiatrist. And that as most uh, opportunities when you go to the psychiatrist, we had some talk therapy and the psychiatrist immediately put me on an antidepressant. So meanwhile, you know, clinical depression, you don't know why. A and that's the distinction, right, mm -hmm. with clinical mm -hmm. depression, is there's no exacerbating moment, mm -hmm. there's no necessary trauma. All of a sudden, something shifts mm -hmm. and life no longer looks the same. Mm -hmm. Now, were you feeling, besides the s lack of sleep and, uh, you know, not being able to concentrate, was there any sadness or loss of the way you interacted in life? Well, event, you know, it, it creeps, Natasha, this, my illness creeps up little by little and takes away a little bit of your life at a time. So the lack of concentration went, then self-esteem went, then hope went. So wow. little by little, it was picking apart who I was. And I remember looking at in myself in the mirror and not even recognizing the shell of the person I had become. Wow. So who you knew yourself to be up until then had disappeared? Completely. From that must be terrifying. Well, it is because your entire personality changes. I went from a very um, enthusiastic extrovert to a, a, a shell of a person who isolated, didn't interact, didn't feel confident enough to even stand up in front of her classroom anymore. She felt like a fike and a phony, that she didn't have the confidence to, to, to teach things that she had taught for 20 years. You know, it occurs to me like it, it can be compared to someone waking up with amnesia in a sense. The person you knew yourself to be has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Now, 
did your, the way you looked at your family and your husband and your children, did they change in your eyes? My family didn't change in my eyes, but my surroundings changed in my eyes. There, it, it was almost as if there was a veil between me and the rest of the world. So colors were dimmed, everything looked gray and dingy. Even and when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Even wow. when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So here you are, you have a job, you have accountabilities, responsibilities, you have a husband, you have children. What was the impact on them and how were they seeing you? Unfortunately, the impact was was pretty severe. I, I couldn't take care of my children anymore. My parents And how old were they at that time? Uh, I had a sixth grader, an eighth grader, and a ninth grader. Wow. So they weren't young, young, but they weren't uh, in ready yeah, they to weren't care young for adults. Myself. Yes, no, yeah. they weren't young adults yet. And so, fortunately, I have a very loving family, and so my mother and father moved into my house. As soon as I was hospitalized, they came in and, and uh, pretty much took over all of my responsibilities. Okay, so I want to, before we make the leap to the hospital, because mm -hmm. to me this is so unfathomable and so <laughs> hard to relate to, mm -hmm. you know, to think it's almost like you're, when you said little pieces being taken away, mm -hmm. you could look at it as cancer in a way, you know, mm -hmm. different pieces are disappearing, not working anymore. And uh, were your children frightened or what was? They were frightened. They wanted their mother back. They couldn't understand what was going on with me because even before I went into the hospital, I, I had irrational thoughts. I, I, I was thinking um, that I, we were going to be bag, a bag family. We were going to lose everything financially. So I literally stopped eating because I thought, what kind of mother would take food out of her children's mouths? So I completely stopped eating. Uh, they, their mother wasn't there anymore. There was a, there was, someone was in, her, in their mother's body. It wasn't by far Thinking their different mother. thoughts, behaving Absolutely. in a different way. And so you, you went to a psychiatrist, you started talk therapy, he put you on anti-anxiety medication. And, and antidepressants. And, or antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And anything happened? Uh, and said, I have the good news and the bad news. The good news is we know what this is. The bad news is it takes between four and six weeks for the medications to kick in. Four weeks into the medication therapy, um, I was in a full-blown psychosis. With Which manifested suicide, a suicide. Uh, ideation. I mm -hmm. was completely consumed with ending this hopelessness. And that's what got me into the hospital. Now, did you know you were on the edge, or was it the people around you who said, whoa, wait a minute, this is more serious than No, that. I shared. I shared my thoughts with my husband. Um, I had a plan, a very well thought out plan. And so the minute I shared those thoughts, the next day I found myself at Carrier Clinic. So what did you share with him? I shared my plan. I, I had to decide, suicide? well, and to take him and the children with me. To, I was trying to convince them to everybody get in the car with me and to drive off a bridge at Washington Crossing Park. Because? The hopelessness was all-consuming and nobody could love them and take care of them the way I could, so they needed to come with me. This is... Uh, to me, this is a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal point because we hear in the news mm -hmm. of women yeah. killing their children. Mm -hmm. And our thoughts are, no, there's, you know, no, no, no. And, we, and yet here you are, this normal, successful, vibrant woman, mm -hmm. months down the road, actually thinking of killing, and it made sense to you. What ma it made absolute sense because I thought, who could love them the way I do? Who could take care of them? Who was going to help them with their homework? Who was going to pack their lunches? Who was going to wash their clothes? So rather than lose you, they'd be better off dead? Well, they would be better off with me. With you? Okay. It's with me. Wow. Than without me. You know what's really amazing, though, is that you shared this with your husband. Oh, yeah, immediately. Because it would have been easy to not share it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, to me, that speaks to something in the relationship and to mm -hmm. who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank God, mm -hmm. because you could have carried out some plan without mm -hmm. sharing it. But at that moment, I suppose it made such sense to you that oh, you yeah. thought he would see it your way. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. thought it made complete sense that this was a way to leave this hopelessness. It's really a key point. Mm -hmm. And um, because it, depression, clinical depression, is not a mood. And it's not something you can snap out of, no way. pull yourself together, you know, snap out mm -hmm. of it.
It's not having the blues. Mm -mm. It's being consumed by something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so then you find yourself in Carrier Clinic. Mm -hmm. And what happened there? Well, for the first 24 days, I was in a lockdown ward because suicidal ideation was all consuming. And um, they doused me with all kind of medications because remember, I got, I'm coming into the hospital, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating, I can't concentrate. And you want to commit suicide. And I want to commit How suicide. How many years ago was this? 1990. I had turned okay. 40 that year. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. And so it's, it's 21 years, years ago. Yeah. yeah, 22 years ago. And um, actually, it's 22 years ago in May. And um, so I, I went to the hospital. They doused me with more medication. They came up with a new cocktail of meds, uh, more talk therapy. And 24 days later, I am no better than the day I went I started that journey at that hospital. So they recommended a, a treatment option that for me was barbaric and out of the movies called uh, shock therapy or better known as convulsive electric therapy. A convulsive, uh, yeah, yeah, convul yeah, electric convulsive therapy, excuse me. And um, ECT. ECT. Yeah. And I, um, it was interesting, Tasha. I wasn't afraid of the therapy as much as I was afraid of what people would think because I had the therapy. Oh, I can so get that. I can so get that. It's the same thing with mental illness. It's the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you'll become some social pariah and mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. you know, I, I read once about someone who was, had cancer and was probably going to die. And the one thing he said was, people walked into that room not seeing me, but just seeing my disease. And so I no longer was there, and that was the most hurtful part. They weren't relating to me. Mm -hmm. They were relating to mm -hmm. me through my disease and through my probable death. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. It's the fear of being seen as your mental illness, mm -hmm. and, and that has even more of a stigma. You know, cancer, well, it wasn't your fault. Mental illness probably was, mm -hmm. is what some people think. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, so 24 days later, so you continue to have suicidal ideation. At this point, if they had let you kind of do what you wanted, would you have done it alone without taking your family with you? Oh, probably. Because I would walk and I would look at a clock and it had glass and I think if I could just break that clock and slit my wrist or I would see a plastic bag and think, oh, if I could take that and, su and smother myself or suffocate myself, that would, that's all I thought about all day long. And in the moment when you're thinking about that, there's no thought that comes in that says, this is a little weird. No. It seems as natural as you and I sitting here talking. Wow. That's powerful. And this is coming from a person who doesn't even believe in abortion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you're going to yes. kill your family. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So devastating and so unfathomable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now, 24 days later, there you are, not getting any better. Mm -hmm. The meds aren't working. Probably you had some side effects, negative side effects mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And yes, go ahead. No, and what I was going to say, and, and so they decide to introduce me to this therapy, right. ECT. And, at, and as I started to say, I wasn't afraid of the therapy as much as I was of what would people think. Would the, would the dean let me back at the college to teach? Mm -hmm. What would my colleagues think? Would my neighbors let their children come to my house knowing my children's mother had shock therapy? So it was, I had so many conflicting thoughts about just the treatment itself and the stigma that goes along with the treatment. And those are valid concerns. Oh, very much so. People don't know much about mm -hmm. this, and so they would look at you that way. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, what was your family doing thinking? My family wanted their... My, my, my parents wanted their daughter back, my children wanted their mother back, my husband wanted his wife back, my sisters wanted their sister back. They were for anything. Just give, do something to help, my, to help her. Do and something. did you share that concern with them about what are people going to think? Uh-huh. Yeah, I did. And they said, well, you're not living now, so you, we got to do something because you have no life now. You have no life now. And um, I eventually said yes. And what had you transition from that to yes? I had a nurse that came in and said she never saw a family more dedicated than mine. And they really needed, they needed you back. And she said, don't you understand, Carol, this could be your secret. Ah, ah so who she knew? she gave me an escape <laughs> mechanism. Mm -hmm. However, when you think about a secret, what comes to mind? 
shame, mm -hmm. guilt. So yes, I did have ECT, and yes, it helped me. But to harbor shame and guilt was as bad as clinical yes. depression. <laughs> yes. So for 10 years, I, I literally, you know, I hid that secret in the... <gasps> you did for 10 years. 10 years. Whew, 10 years I hid it. That's tough. Mm -hmm. Wow. In between that, I had three more bouts. It's okay. I just didn't have one bout. Okay, so I want to ask you... Um, so now you, this woman says to you, you know, it mm -hmm. could be a secret, and mm -hmm. that kind of gives you some hope that there's mm -hmm. something manageable about it. And so you decide to go ahead with it. And um, what was that first experience like? The first experience, they, you, you get to see a movie of the entire process, so you're pretty much at least aware of what's going to happen. It's it's so different than what you see in the media and through in the movies. Uh, it's a very humane treatment option. You have anesthesia. You have a muscle relaxant. You you have a heart mo monitor on. You have a um, a pulse monitor. It's everything is done after you are put to sleep. So you get a bite plate in your mouth. You have some gel put where they're going to put the um, the actual handles for the ECT. And it's a grand mal seizure. It's a, that's they what it is. They induce that. They induce a grand mal seizure that lasts anywhere from 2 to 14 or 15 seconds. And then um, you come out of the anesthesia very quickly. The whole process from being put to sleep to when you wake up is less than 30 minutes. Wow. It's a very quick process. So as you're lying there that first time getting ready for it, what are your thoughts and feelings? My thoughts, believe it or not, my thoughts were, oh my goodness, at least I'm going to get some sleep. It's induced sleep, but at least I'm going to sleep. Because I didn't sleep at all in the hospital. I wasn't sleeping at home. And I, I really wasn't sleeping in the hospital either. And I remember thinking, well, this could, this could be pretty good because I'm going to get some <laughs> induced <laughs> sleep. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah. When I was diagnosed as diabetic, I was so exhausted. Yeah. And the diagnosis came a little you know, late into the process mm -hmm. that when they said, okay, you know, you have to be, go to the hospital, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll Violet. get to sleep. Yeah, and right. I had two young children, yeah. but yeah, it was, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. let me just sleep. Let me, let me sleep. Yeah. Right, let me sleep. So you're lying there thinking, okay, great, I'm I'll get sleep. to sleep. Right. <laughs> and then when you wake up after the first treatment. I have a headache. Okay. I had a little bit of a headache. Uh, I was um, tired. Be from the you know from the contractions of the seizure, my muscles were a little achy, but I was already in bad joint aches anyway from lack of sleep, and um, I went back to the ward. Now in the it took fall, it took three treatments before the suicidal ideation ceased. And were the three treatments like Monday, day Wednesday, day? Friday? Okay, alternative days. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so after three treatments, you now my don't. affect changed. Wow. My affect, my husband walked in and he had tears and, and I said, you know, what's going on? And he said, you've got life in your face again. Whew. You've got life in your face. And I said, and you know what? I don't think, I don't think I'm thinking about killing myself anymore. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that a pivotal moment for you? Mm -hmm. The biggest pivotal moment was weeks after the ECT was completely, and I was through the day program, through the full-time hospitalization. And I was sitting in my house one day, and I was sitting in there, and I remember feeling, oh my gosh, this house is so beautiful. It was almost like somebody took the veil and lifted it up. Wow. So it's like you were saying before where you didn't see colors mm -mm. as brightly. Now all of a sudden you see your home. You know, it's so incredible about mental illness because I remember reading somewhere where uh, multiple personalities, where one of the personalities would wear prescription glasses mm -hmm. and the other wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, the body is unbelievable. So there's something chemical going on mm -hmm. that alters. Well, yeah, because even, because I lost taste, I lost my senses. I lost the feeling of touch. I've lost my, I lost taste. I lost smell. I, it was the weird, weirdest thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. this, it, this illness really, it robs you of your ability to live life and engage in life. So how long did it take? And you know, I just, I was doing some research and I just wanted to share this online about, um, you know, uh, there's this whole thing, nobody really knows why the electric shock therapy works, they have ideas. And uh, 
Someone said in a study this year, in a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal, they found that ECT appears to turn down overactive connections yeah. between parts of the brain that control mood mm -hmm. and parts that control thinking and concentration. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing was that psilocybin, mm -hmm. the active ingredient in mm -hmm. the psychedelic uh, also disrupts the network of connections and may also be effective. Do you know of anybody who's been treated with no. <laughs> psychedelics? No, I personally do not. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so again, by when could you go home and start back into your life? Well, I was, for the first um, episode, I was hospitalized for 38 days mm -hmm. and then I went into a, um, a four-week day program. So once I was released from the hospital, I was still going back to the hospital for four weeks, but during the day only, and then coming every back. Every day or every second uh, day? Or? Do you know, off the top of my head, I do not recall if it were. I, I, I'm almost certain it was every day. So it wasn't just going back for electric shock therapy. Oh, it was no, for no. It was for therapy, therapy and, yeah. it was other things. Right. There, there so like an groups, outpatient. Like, group, yeah. like an outpatient, exactly. Did that help? Well, it gave me, it, it, it gave my family a way to have me cared for without them worrying about that I was home. Yeah. And um, so I would, I would do that. But it took me about three months after the last ECT treatment before I really felt capable of going back to work, mm -hmm. um, picking up all the responsibilities as a mother and a wife and, and a, a part-time instructor. It took me about three months. Considering what you went through, it, in a way it's almost miraculous that after mm -hmm. three months mm -hmm. you could actually do all this. Did you suffer from memory loss? Um, more short term than mm -hmm. long term. And the short term memory, it, it, it took about, I, I think, uh, about three months for the short term memory to really start to settle down again. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I couldn't remember if I, did I, did I go to the grocery store? Where did I just drop a child off? Like those kinds of things. What was happening at the, at the minute? Do I have long-term memory loss? How would I know that? <laughs> okay. It's a good point. Okay. Other than um, my children will uh, sometimes say to me, Mom, remember when? And I'll say, well, give me some more information. And I'll say, you know, I don't recollect that at all. There's nothing there. Now, people will say to me, well, was that worth it? You bet. Because I got my life back again. I don't personally think I'd be alive if it weren't for ECT. It sounds like it. And you know, it's interesting, um, Carrie Fisher mm -hmm. uh, wrote this book. Uh, 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 Shockaholic. This was a, another one. Oh, it was another about her one. drinking. Oh. And, and, but she did, and she started by saying she did opt in the end for electric shock uh -huh. therapy. I think she had been diagnosed very late with a bipolar disorder. <laughs> But uh, she says, yes, I opted for short-term memory loss. And she said she changed her voice <laughs> message when people called. I may, if you think I remember you, leave a message. If you don't think I remember you, leave a message and tell me who you are. And if I remember, I'll call you back. Something to that effect. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was just managing it. But, you know, again, when you hear somebody opting for it, mm -hmm. you really realize they're at a point of distress because they've got all the preconceived ideas about ECT as mm -hmm. the world does. Mm -hmm. um, so did your children look at you differently afterwards? I'm sure they did. Did they, did they say that to me? No. I, I recall my children vividly saying things like, geez, mom, you must be coming back because you're making sense. They would wow. say that to me. Uh, I remember one time um, coming into the house on a day pass and, and asking my daughter to plug in my curling iron and her saying, oh, mom, you must be coming back. You haven't combed your hair in weeks and you want to set it. My, mo my mom's coming back kind of things. Um, they, I will tell you for the longest of time, not only my, my husband and my children, but my sisters and my parents, they treated me like a China doll. That's what I was going to I was ready you. to, I could, if, the, if anything happened, even if they blew at me, that I would crumble into a gazillion pieces. And unfortunately, that went on for 10 years because in, those ten year, in a 10-year period, I had four major bouts, all requiring additional hospitalization, all requiring additional shock therapy. Did that make you feel, and we've got two minutes and then we're gonna take a break and we're gonna do part two, mm -hmm. but did that make you feel guilty, ashamed, nervous, uh, unequal, like? It made, it made me feel 
vulnerable. It made mm. me feel that any minute the beast could come back and put me to my put me on my knees again. And yeah. so I, I in the, the in those t in that ten year period, I wasted a tremendous amount of wellness mm. in fear that the beast would return. Sure. And it did. And how could you not? And and because I kept they kept telling me in the hospital that you have the kind of depression that's going to come back again. Well, thank they you. They told for, you that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Over and over again, they would tell me that. Not that it might come back. It will come well, back. it's going it's going it will come back. They still tell me that that it's been 12 years since my last break, and they still tell me that um, I think it could come back anytime. Could come back is one thing, but you mm -hmm. know. You need to retrain. <laughs> well, you have 100 percent. So you have had uh, after you have a third bout, it's a 100 percent chance that you'll have additional wow. ones. Carol, we're going to have to end the first part. Thank you so much. It's just uh, uh, to me, it takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing, and also it provides hope for everybody. That's my goal. So thank you. And then we'll come back and do another half hour. Thank, thank you. you. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us.